Let's turn to Philippians chapter 4. We went over uh, verse 1 Sunday night, but we're going to read 1 through 7. Philippians chapter 4, 1 through 7. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, 1 through 7. And before we read it, those of y'all that know me, uh, there's some words in here I can't say, so y'all just get over it if I say them wrong, all right? Philippians chapter 4, 1 through 7. Huh? At the end. Thou. Philippians chapter 4, 1 through 7. Everybody there? Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech you, Odious, and I beseech Sintic, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, we've come before you today, God, just so humble. So humble, God, but we come boldly because we need you. And we know that you've given us access to your throne room. And God, we need you today. We need your throne room. We need the manifestation of your kingdom to be brought to this little church here in Sydney Missionary Baptist. God, because we need your word. And we don't just need words, but we need your word. And we need your word delivered to us by the Holy Spirit. We don't need man's word. We need word delivered from you, God. And that we ask because we know that what we need you'll supply. And you've told us time and time again that we need your word. So we ask you to deliver. We ask you to change our lives, change our hearts, change our minds, change our uh, everything that, that has anything pertaining to our lives. God, help us be a witness for you. Help us to be ambassadors for your kingdom, God. When people see us, God, we hope that we be found in you and that people can see you through us. And God, the only way that's going to be possible is if you take control. So we ask you today to take control of our lives through your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Man, my mouth is dry. You guys pray for me. Because i got about an hour and a half worth of talking to do. So. Now, Lord willing, we'll get through all these uh, verses here. And there's a reason we're going to get through all of them. Uh, but we'll, just a quick uh, refresh of uh, verse 1. Uh, Therefore, my brethren, uh, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and my crown. Uh, you remember what we talked about Sunday night. If we really love God, then we know what God's plan is, and that none should perish. We know that's what his desire is. He doesn't want anybody to go to die in hell. So if we love God, then we care about the things that God cares about. So when God's love is in our hearts and, our, and God's love is reflected off our lives and causes someone else to come to Christ, then that makes us joyful, doesn't it? If we have our priorities straight. And when I have partaken in leading somebody to Christ, then they're my crown. Because if I love God, then I have His love in me, which means I care about everybody else more than myself. So when, everybody, when somebody else experiences God love, God's love and is saved, that's my reward. 
because I don't want anything else other than what God wants. Is that pretty simple? And I know that's hard for us to be in that mind state at all times. And we're not going to be because we wrestle with this flesh. But that's exactly what he's talking about here. goes on to say, so stand fast in the Lord. And we talked about standing fast. When somebody to tells you to stand fast, that means hang on. That means the road may get rough. And I gave you the example of your life's like a puzzle. You've, you've worked thus far trying to put this puzzle together on your own. And then finally you turn it over to Christ. So he's got to restart the puzzle. So it gets shaken up and everything that you've built falls apart. And that's uncomfortable we got to stand fast through that period of time, trusting that He's putting our life back together the way that He wants it, which is going to be much better for us. Verse 2, and we'll try to be quick through these. They're, they're important, but not real important. Uh, I beseech thee, uh, Euodius and Sintic, and you all can say them however you want. I say them the best way I can. That they be of the same mind in the Lord. Now there is two different viewpoints on this. Uh, one is that both of these are women. And the other is one is the wife and one is the husband. And the reason that it's believed that one's a wife and one's a husband is because in the next verse he says, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. Fellow. But when you look up yoke fellow, and the, the Greek word is, and y'all gonna laugh at me, right? Sudgu, yeah, that one. Sudzugos. And it means co yoked or a colleague or a Christian. I don't see no male or female in that. But either way, whether it be a husband and a wife or a wife and a sister or a, a, a two female cousins or whatever, what's the point is, what's he trying to get them to do here? He's beseeching them, which means to invite or exhort or entreat or pray. So if you invite somebody to come somewhere, then in that moment they're not there where you're inviting them to be, right? So evidently these two people here weren't of the same mind. And Paul was inviting them to be of the same mind. And, and, you know, we've talked about that before. Why should we should be of the same mind? But either way, whether this was a husband and wife, and husband and wife should be of the same mind. And two women in the church should be of the same mind. And we've talked about uh, what happens when we're not in the same mind. Uh, but in verse 3 goes on to say, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel with Clement also. So women are important in the gospel, ain't they? Even, even though there's a lot of emphasis put on the male being the head, uh, being the leader in the families, that's true. But you can't take away from the fact that women are awesome. They are awesome. <laughs> Is that all the amens I get? Hey, Barb. <laughs> Amen me. Women are awesome, and God uses them. And a lot of times he uses them more than us because we're less emotional, and they're built up with nothing but emotions sometimes. And God uses them. They reach out farther. They love more than we do. We have different purposes, so God uses them. Okay, guys, sit down in the back, right? <laughs> But he's entreating them, or he's beseeching them, or he's uh, inviting them, or he's praying that they will be, or, or entreating, exhorting that uh, they be of one mind and they help each other. And then he says, with Clement also. So that tells me that Clement was probably an outcast. If he's telling them to make sure that you include Clement in this, which it's obvious to me that she was a female. Help those women that labor with me in the gospel with Clement also. This tells me that there may have been some hard feelings toward her. And look, I don't know if she had done something wrong or maybe she had done something good and everybody else was jealous of her. It does not matter. Work together was his point. And we're going to get into that deeper in a minute. Uh, and with my other fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Now think about that for a minute. If all these people that he's telling them to work together, as far as the book of life is concerned, all their names are written in it, then what could possibly cause you to be working against each other? Think about that for a second. The book of life, Matthew 7, 14 says, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. We're already outnumbered. I felt that. 
we're already outnumbered. There ain't many of us. You say, oh, these hundreds of thousands of millions of Christians. You compare that to every soul that's ever existed in this world and see how little of a percentage it is. And we don't know the true percentage. But we're already outnumbered. Why would we try to fight against each other? Why would we not be running in the same direction? I can tell you right now, if we all understood God's love fully, we'd be running in the same direction. Verse 4, and we're going to get in, into how we accomplish that. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. How in the world does that go with that? Why would he throw that in there? He's telling you guys need to be like-minded. Need to do this. All your names are in the book of life. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I'm going to give you an example. If... Uh, if a baseball coach comes into town and he starts recruiting baseball players and this boy wasn't a good player but the coach taught him how to play, put him on the team and went out here and got him a shortstop and got him a catcher, went down here and got him a cleanup hitter. He said, boy, he was too big. Everybody made fun of him, but man, he's strong. And I can teach him to hit, so the coach is going to make him the cleanup hitter and play third base. And he gets all this team together, and then the shortstop makes a mistake, so the second baseman looks at him, and he kind of chuckles a little bit, and laughs at him, makes fun of him. And then the center fielder makes a big dive and play, and the fans go crazy, and the rest of the team gets jealous. And then the third baseman, which is a cleanup hitter, he gets up and hits a home run, and then everybody else looks down on him because they can't hit a home run even though they weren't the cleanup hitter. You put a man in the cleanup hit position because he's your power hitter. The leadoff batter's mad at the cleanup batter because he can hit a home run. The leadoff batter's a lot faster than the third baseman who's the cleanup hitter. So we let him get on base first so maybe he can steal around so maybe that the cleanup hitter can maybe get a sacrifice fly or something and get him in. It's a team effort. But you see how everybody ain't have, don't have the same mind. Now, what would change that if they'd all look at the coach that come and got them at their homes when they wasn't nothing? They wasn't no baseball player. He taught them. He went to the fat guy that nobody else liked and made a cleanup hitter out of him. Went to the skinny guy that everybody made fun of and made a leadoff hitter out of him. If everybody would join in the coach because the coach has a goal of winning. So now if all of them would just push their desires and their stupid thoughts to the side, and I can tell you a lot of times their mind is clouded by stupid thoughts. If they would put all those to the side and remember what the coach did for them, and they rejoiced in the coach, and they knew the coach wanted to win, so now they're all going to play together. And the man that made the error that may have cost them that game, everybody else is going to get together and try to help him get to where he won't make that mistake again. So when we rejoice in the Lord, what we're doing is we are, uh, we're, uh, when we rejoice in Him, then that means that we're understanding His love, we're feeling His love, and that therefore will cause us to love one another. When we start rejoicing in the Lord, what that really means is that we have put our eyes back on our first love. Our first love. To be able to do this, then we must understand we were enemies to God, and He had loved us anyway. Loved us anyway. He left his throne and became flesh and was made sin and suffered the cross even when we didn't love him. And when we do this, this uh, provokes us, to, or when he did this, it provokes us to love each other because we understand that we were all on the same page before Christ. So now we love him because he first loved us. So we care about what he cares about, which is lost souls. So now our hearts have been supernaturally aligned back on what matters, which is working together as a unit so we can win souls for Christ. So that's why we rejoice in the Lord. And you can't rejoice in the Lord until you understand what he did for you. See how it works? Back on to verse 5 now. Now these last three verses you could really... Uh, do one lesson in them. Five through seven. 
they all work hand in hand, and they work hand in hand with uh, one through four too. But five through seven gives you a what to do, a how to do it, and why. Verse five says, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Uh, moderation is the act of being moderate. Being moderate is temperate, uh, being patient. Uh, a moderator is the one who's in charge. Uh, if somebody moderates a business meeting, he's over that business meeting. A moderator in physics is a substance used to slow down neutrons in an atomic energy reactor. I ain't got a clue what that means. <laughs> but what I see in that is slow down. So evidently this moderator has the ability to slow something down that was fast. It's usually made of graphite or beryllium. It's hard but non-corrosive. Or it's moved with compassion but not moved in their faith. That makes sense. It's hard but it'll bend a little bit so it don't snap. And it's able to slow something that's moving too fast down. It's temperate. It's patience. And we're supposed to let this moderation in our lives be known unto all men, or to let all men see this moderation in our lives. So when your moderation is seen, then you're causing everyone to slow down and see what's really going on. You see that? We're going to go a little deeper into that. Verse 6. Be careful for nothing. That means worry about nothing. Worry about nothing. Boy, it's easier said than done, ain't it? Well, if I told you, I can tell you how to do it. Now remember verse 5, we're coming back to it. Give everything to God is what this verse means. Ask Him. Pray about the situations. Don't worry about nothing, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving... And you can't have that until you rejoice in Him because when you rejoice in Him, you know what He's done for you. So it all comes hand in hand. So we're not worried about nothing, but everything that we was worried about, we just give to God. Now this is what we should do. Verse 7 says, And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. If you have no peace, then you're losing your heart and your mind. You ever been losing your mind because you didn't have no peace? I know you've been there. Somebody amen me. You've been there, ain't you? It'll torment you. You lose your mind. You feel like your heart is just falling plumb apart. And God is saying, here, I'll give you my peace, and my peace will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now we hear that. Now what's really going on? Now, if you're a moderator, you're slowing everybody down and showing them what's really going on. So whenever we lose our peace, there's one contributing factor that I want to talk about today. And there's a few, okay? But all of them would probably just about, I'd say 98% of the factors that would cause us to lose our peace comes back to what we call time. I'm sick and I take meds so I ain't sick as long. Time's a factor there. I'm terminally sick so I'm running out of time. Time's a factor there. My bills aren't paid and in a matter of time I'm going to lose my house. My truck payment ain't paid and in a matter of time I'm going to lose my truck. My power bill ain't paid, my water bill ain't paid, etc. In a matter of time, they're going to cut them off. My children ain't saved, they're running out of time. Time. So most of the time, when we're losing our peace, time was a contributing factor. So if we could really take time out of the equation, we could have peace, couldn't we? How do you take time out of the equation? We're going to talk about the chain, that, uh, uh, the chart that I drew up uh, a while back. And this is what I was talking to you all about today, Anna. Uh, the chain of a successful Christian life, which started with, you all remember, injecting the Word? 
Now we're going to come back to verse 5. Injecting the word means you learn about God's love, right? Now, injecting the word leads to faith. Faith comes uh, by hearing, hearing by the word. The faith is you learn to trust God because you know you can. You know who he is because you studied his word, so now you give it to him. Now your faith leads to joy, and your joy is the comfort in his love. So he loves you, you have faith in him because he loves you, and not only does he love you, but he's able and willing to do all these great things for you. So I'm in comfort now because the creator of all things loves me, and that's joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength, and now you have the strength to share his love. And you have strength, and that leads to obedience, so that means you will share His love. And when you share His love, that's true discipleship, and it's a true representation of who God is. So that means when you accomplish all these things, you're an ambassador. You're more like Christ, and Christ is seated at the right hand of God outside the realm of time. So when you accomplish all these things in your life, God's not affected by time, and He's conforming you to the image of His Son. So now you're not affected by time as much, because time is now replaced by faith. Does that make sense? Have you ever been to the point of your life when, oh man, got to get this done quick, and then the peace of God overshadows you, and you're like, all right, in God's time. You ever thought God was taking too long, and then when He worked, you said, man, He was right on time. I see now how that was exactly when it was supposed to happen. The more that we are conformed to the image of Christ Jesus, and we do that through the Word, through the sanctification process, the less that time factors on our life. We don't worry about time because we have a Father in Heaven that is outside the realm of time, and at any time He wants to stop something or move something or fix something, He can do it because He controls time. You don't believe in time travel, you don't believe in God because He can be in a part of your life at any time. He wrote the whole thing and then pushed play. And the more we learn about that, the less that time affects our life, which allows the peace of God to come in and our hearts and minds are safe in Christ. Ain't that beautiful? That's beautiful. I told you that there's something to do. Uh, there's how to do it and uh, why to do it. Uh, what to do is to be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. And the result of that is the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's awesome. But there's now a bigger reason that we should do this, and it's back to verse 5. And I told you how to do that. It's through that chart I just give you. Giving it all to God. And that's in verse 6. Don't worry about nothing, but give it to God. And we know how we do that. Uh, number five is the why. Let your moderation be known unto men. The Lord is at hand. So now we understand this. Time doesn't affect our, our peace, but Christ does now. We've allowed Christ to take time out of the equation, and we trust His timing. But one thing this time, uh, time zone should affect is that we are busy getting to the Father's business because the Lord is at hand. You know, we are, we talked about a couple of studies ago that our citizenship has changed from this earth to heaven. You ever flew and went through a different time zone? Had to move your watch? Well, we just took our watches off when we become a citizen of heaven because time doesn't matter anymore. The things that we were trying to hurry up and accomplish, Christ accomplishes for us. And we'll never enter into His rest until we understand that. Rest means that you just sit there and relax knowing that God's taking care of you. You trust. But the part of us that needs to be moving and working fast because time is affecting something is the Christ in us. And the part that time is affecting is everybody that's lost. They are running out of time. So this is the what to do, the how to do, and why to do it. We not only trust God because it benefits us, but when we trust God, people see that, hey, He's not affected by this time zone. He must be from somewhere else. Or He's got something that I don't have that I need. 
When you let your moderation be known to men, when you see that you're moved with compassion by them, but you're not breaking, something comes upon you and you're really slowing it down. You're in charge of your situation. Now, they don't know that it's really Christ that's in charge of this situation. They just see Zeke step or Will step or Fonzo or Ronnie or Amy, any of you all. They see something coming at you and it doesn't move you. Does it move you? Matter of fact, you're moved with compassion for them while you're in this tough place. Like Paul in prison worried about everybody else. This allows you to do this and it allows your moderation to change other people's life. You're non-corrosive. You're non-corrosive so the things of this earth isn't affecting you. Time isn't taking your joy away even though it's taking theirs away. They'll say, man, there's something different about them. I wonder what it is. And then you can tell them. But if we're allowing situations to move us and we're not taking this process seriously, which means time is going to start taking our joy away, it's going to start taking our mind away and our heart away, it's going to start affecting us. So now we can't be the witness that we were called to be because every little wind and every little thunder and every little earthquake is moving us everywhere. But you see, when, our, when we are truly a moderator for Christ and our moderation is being seen, then we're like this. We're bending, but we ain't breaking. There's every reason in the world we should be corroding, but we're not. And every time somebody comes by you, they can't help but notice the strength in your life, and it slows them down so they can start to understand what's really going on in this life. And what's really going on in this life is they're running out of time. And you can bring the Savior to them by letting your moderation be known unto men. Any questions? Are we on the same baseball team or what? Circle prayer.